This video is going to be a two-parter, so two reasonably short parts. We're going to have a look at steering and give you a, an illustration of how we can implement it within the gauge framework. We're going to be building upon the, the lecture within which we set out different types of steering behaviour. So here we'll, we'll look at an implementation of um, a look-at behaviour, of a seek behaviour, of a separate behaviour, and to show how we can fit these things together into a simple game-like setting, sort of a space-based setting. Um, in this first lecture, what we're going to be concerned about is, is looking at the framework, the overall structure within which the demo was set up. So we'll have um, a demo game. Um, inside that there'll be a main menu, inside that there'll be a steering demo game screen within that. And we'll have a look at how those different classes are created, what their purposes are, how they fit together, and briefly some of the different objects. But in terms of the actual steering behaviours themselves, we'll look at those in, in a separate short video. I'll give you an illustration of what, the, um, uh, what, what this thing will look like when you run it yourself. So whenever we run it, this is our main menu, very simple main menu with a couple of images that are clickable and when we click on the appropriate one, it triggers the demo for that. So I'm interested here in my red spaceship demo. So if I click on this, I have um, a randomized collection of, it's going to be asteroids, um, a red player controlled ship, uh, there'll be some green spaceships and also some turrets and that you see there on the screen. Now, the way this is set up, is that the asteroids just simply sit there and rotate. The turrets, they will always try to look towards the player and the spaceships, the green ones, have been set up to try to head, they're always going to seek the player out, but at the same time, they're going to try to avoid hitting the player, avoid hitting themselves, hitting asteroids, hitting the turrets, uh, using the separate behavior as a way of doing it. Now, there is no collision detection in this, so I can happily drive over the top of everything, and indeed the other objects will occasionally run over the top of themselves as well. Uh, it's randomly created, so every single time you go in, you get a, a completely random um, uh, location of all of the different objects uh, within the, the game. So it's not really a big game per se, so it's more just simple demo way of illustrating this. So we'll have a look first of all at the broad structure, the framework within which we have this. And hopefully you'll recall then, for the gauge setup, it's based on a game fragment. And that's our main heart that we extend, and the game fragment contains all the useful management elements. So here we have a demo game, uh, which is going to be a type of, of game. And when we create our demo game, um, we're setting it to be 20 um, frames per second because it's running in a, a, an emulator. For creating the, the view, the only thing we're doing there is that we are uh, creating a main menu, um, which is which, the, the thing that was displayed at the start. Uh, this particular bit here is our main menu, and we're adding that into our screen manager. So that becomes the thing then that gets to be displayed on the screen. And a bit about the, the back key, whenever the back key is pressed, we, we sort of check to see if we're not in the main menu, if we're in an uh, initial one of the demos and the back key is pressed, then put the main menu back on. Or if we are in the main menu, you notice it's the top of our navigational hierarchy and the back key is pressed, then exit out of the application. Menu screen itself, so this is the where the two buttons appeared. Um, we have menu screen, it's a type of game screen, so again we're extending that base class. It's, it's, it's a very simple menu screen. We basically are going to have two rectangles uh, for each of the demos, a spaceship and a platform demo. Um, so in terms of what we are displaying here, we're not being fancy by way of saying we have a, a world space and a screen space and sort of different coordinates we're mapping onto, which we will be whenever we're doing the actual demo itself. Here we're just saying this is the screen. We're defining two on-screen rectangles giving them an image, and whenever we click on those on-screen rectangles, we'll trigger the appropriate demo. Um, so the bit down here simply says, right, we're going to load in the bitmaps, uh, and we're, we're going to create a rectangle um, to hold those particular bitmaps. And it's just in a simple sort of six by three grid. If we update our uh, demo, the screen, so, so there effectively the main screen, we want to see do we have any input. If we do, check to see if it occurred within the bounds of those two rectangles. If it did, then trigger uh, and launch that particular demo. So we're going to our input manager, which is within the, um, the main game fragment. If we do have some touch events, so some touch event has occurred on the screen, 
then we, um, and this here, we're just checking the first touch event. So we're not assuming we have a fancy multi-touch menu. This is a simple, you, you touch the screen once it, based on that first touch point, that's what it's going to trigger. So there's nothing fancy here about multi-touch or anything like that. Set lines down here are actually fairly um, similar. So a similar block of code if we're triggering the spaceship demo or the second one for the platform, the collision detection demo, which we'll, we'll look at later on in another video. Uh, so this one here, that if this rectangle contains the touch point, then we are going to our screen manager and we're saying remove ourselves. So we're removing the main menu. We're creating a new steering demo um, and linking it into the main game fragment. And we're then going to the screen manager and we're saying, okay, here, make this, add this in. Because it's the only screen that will contain at that point, it automatically becomes the current screen. So then that's it. So next time then our, our game fragment updates, it'll go to the game screen manager. It'll say, what's the current screen? It's going to say it's now the new um, steering demo has been added in and will then trigger the update and the draw of that particular one. Uh, that's it for the draw. All we're doing is, is getting the two bitmaps and drawing them out to those two rectangles on the screen. So the, the steering demo game screen, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it, it is the type of game screen and it's our steering demo uh, game screen. Um, so this is the, the thing that contains this world within which we were able to, to move around and the objects we were able to, um, they, to use their steering behaviours within. We define a, a width and a height. So these, these are not pixel values per se, that they're sort of world coordinate values. And you know, it's just a thousand by thousand, just an arbitrary size that we created for the world. We've got a screen viewport and we've got a layer viewport. Now the layer viewport will be that region of that a thousand by thousand uh, area and the screen viewport is going to be the whole screen that we're drawing to. We've got uh, definitions of the objects that populate that world. So we're going to have our background object. So whenever we, we run this here, there's a, a spacey background. Uh, so this, this is just simply a, an object um, which was created to be the same size as the level which contained a reasonably high resolution bitmap. Uh, alongside that, then, we had a total of 20 asteroids, uh, five seekers, which was the green ships that tried to seek me out, and five turrets. Uh, we stored our asteroids in a list of asteroids, and we stored our, our well, for these ones here, the AI spaceships, in, in a list of AI uh, spaceships. We get to create those, so you're going to see how we create those in a second. So for the constructor for the game screen, um, we're, we're calling the default constructor a sensible thing to do. We're creating up our screen viewport to be the, the full size of the screen. So in this sense, there is no black areas or anything around it. We're using all of the screen. Um, with a little bit there about taking into account the, the aspect uh, ratio when we're creating our layer viewport. Um, so we, we, we check to see, okay, what aspect ratio of the screen we're loading on and then we create a layer viewport that maps onto that same aspect ratio. So make sure then that whenever we're displaying our game objects that they're not stretched um, if, if, we, if the screen viewport ended up having a different aspect ratio than our assumed layer viewport. So we simply map the two. But here for the asset manager for loading in uh, all of the images that we use, so we've got two asteroid images, um, different spaceship ones and, and the turret one uh, as well. There we have our background for loading that particular one in. And you can see that when we create it, it's, it's a game object, so it's used on the, the game object class. Its uh, center point is half of the width, half of the height, that is indeed at the, the middle point of the screen and its width and its height are set to the size of the, the overall level. So effectively, it's one object that's located in the middle, as big as the level is, and, and that's how we did our, or handled our background in this case. Nothing fancy. We're creating our player spaceship. So initially at position 100 to 100. Um, so if I go back and I rerun it again, so there the, the player notionally 0, 0 is our bottom left in the world. The player is 100 in and 100 up. That's their um, starting point. We go through and we randomly create our asteroids in any old location. If we were doing this better, we would check to, to see if we create an asteroid, compare it with the locations of the previously created one so we don't have the possibility of overlap. But it's a simple demo, so there is a possibility of overlap here. Now, for the AI spaceships, um, 
I'm creating there a, a list of um, the number of seekers plus the number of turrets. So a turret, you wouldn't necessarily think of as a, a spaceship per se, but in this case, both the, the green ships and the, the, the turrets, which are sort of stationary, they're both types of AI spaceships. So they're things that, that exist um, that run and that update or otherwise change their position. Uh, the green ships are ones that actually move around. Uh, the turrets, they don't move, but they rotate. But in essence, they're, they're based on the same basis. The only way, meaningful way in which they differ is the types of steering behavior that they implement that provides in them with a different uh, overall outcome in terms of how they behave. So we go through, we create um, our seekers, we create our turrets. And uh, the reason they're added into one array is, is because then I can simply go to that array and say to all of the entities within it, you know, update yourselves or draw yourselves. And each of them will determine how they get to be updated, how they get to be drawn. But from my point of view, they're just game objects that I want to update and to draw. Um, a little bit here about getting the player spaceship or getting the AI spaceships or getting asteroids. So the reason we have these three methods inside this is that Whenever, for example, my AI spaceship, which we're going to look at in the, the, the next video, whenever it is working out um, using a separate behavior, it'll want to get access to the player. So it knows who the player is, so it can try to avoid hitting the player. Ditto with the asteroids, ditto with the other spaceships. So we need to have a way then of enabling that AI spaceship to query, to get access to the location of everything else. Um, so the AI spaceship will know that it's a member of this game screen and in the game screen we're exposing these methods uh, So get player spaceship get AI spaceship get asteroids um, Which will let it then query the location of all the other objects um, Update So we're going to the spaceship uh, first of all we're asking it to update itself It's going to be based on a bit of touch based setups um, There's a bit down here to make sure that the player can't leave the confines of the world. So if I, I try to, to go down to the bottom, I'm you know, trying to push off the side, but I'm being confined to, to my world and not able to, to leave. It is a constraint put in the player, as you can see, because the green ships are quite happily able to wander out of the world and then wander back onto it. But from the player's point of view, they can't. You'll also notice that here I am moving my viewport about the level, so the bit of the background changes. Um, but if I were to, again, go back down to my corner, the viewport stops. So the viewport itself doesn't move or doesn't leave the confines of the level. So we're, we're putting in some restriction to make sure the player can't leave the level, so they always seem to be in our world, and the viewport can't leave the level. So the bit of the world that we get to be rendered on the screen is always going to be a visible bit. Uh, so this is a bit, first of all, ensure the player can't leave the confines of the world. Just check in the player's location. If they leave, then we bump them back. Um, and then it says focus the, the viewport on the player. So by default, uh, whenever the player moves, we change the viewport so that they are the viewport is always centered on the player. And what this means is that this is a default location over here. The player will seem to be in the middle of the viewport. And as I move around, the player remains in the middle of the viewport. The only time that changes is if the viewport would have to leave the confines of the world. So in that case, we, we don't let the viewport do that. So this is the bit here, ensure the viewport can't leave the confines of the world. So there we restrict both to be within our world. It's a sensible thing to do. Um, update each of our AI controlled spaceships. Uh, so there we're simply going through them, uh, that array and asking each of them to update itself they'll trigger whatever steering behaviors are appropriate. Update the asteroids. Asteroids just simply rotate on the spot, so they're updated separately. If we're drawing it out, um, quite straightforward, we, we, we clear it. Um, we're, we're clipping this here just to the, the, the background. We're drawing out, so again, this is the right draw order, or initial background first of all. Then the rest of the things doesn't really matter. We're drawing our asteroids, then we're drawing an AI-controlled spaceships, then we're drawing the player. And you can see that when you do have overlap of the, the objects in the game. So if I move the player on top of well, any of these things, the player is always the thing that appears on, on the top because it was the last one that was drawn in the draw order. Now that's, um, well, look, well, just do the asteroid class very quickly because that's, that's a non-steering one. Um, so asteroid is, is a type of, of sprite. So it, it's something that can move, doesn't move in this case, just rotates. It's using the rotational aspect of the sprite. 
Uh, we're creating a, a random number um, generator. It doesn't really need it in this particular one, but if you're using the other ones, you'll, you'll see how in the next video. Um, for this one here, when we're creating the, the asteroid, uh, we give it a location, a center point, the screen to which it belongs, uh, and we're using the, the, the super constructor to, of the sprite to pass those pieces of information um, in. Um, normally, you can pass in a bitmap, but we're not passing in a bitmap immediately at this point because we want to, um, to to load in a bitmap and we've got two of them available, Asteroid 1 and Asteroid 2. So we, let's see if we can actually notice the, the difference between some of them. So for you, yeah, I mean, well, you can have a look at it yourself in, in, in as much detail as you want, but they are sort of slightly different images that are being used for um, the, the asteroids. But there we are going to randomly get a boolean, true or false, and then based on that, randomly load in asteroid 1 or asteroid 2, um, the, the image. So it has a little bit of visual variety. We give it um, a half width and a half height. If we do then want to put in collision detection, we have it given it a bound. And this is the movement bit. Uh, we're giving it some angular velocity, so it will rotate. And it's going to rotate a um, next float. Um, so it'll be a random value between 0 and 1 times 40. So this will give me here a value between 0 and 40. And I'm taking away 20 from it. So in effect, I'll have an angular velocity between minus 20 to plus 20. So randomly, one direction, it'll rotate at some particular speed. Now that's all we want to cover in this video, and it's really just giving you the, the, the setup within which all of this sort of hangs and fits uh, together. In the next video, we're going to go on to, to, to look at the steering behaviours specifically to see how, how they work, how they operate.